In order to get a good idea of how computers execute instructions, we're going back to the beginning. Not the fundamentals, we're going back to the beginning of time. The very first computers had some rather unique ways of storing values. For example, Charles Babbage, whenever he stored a decimal digit, he did it on a, on a three inch high cylinder of steel with zero through nine painted around the, uh, the, the perimeter of it. And you make a column of 40 of these digits, you had a 10 foot tall number to store a number, a 10 foot tall column to store a number. Um, the IBM Automatic Sequence Controlled Calculator also used kind of cylinders in order to store values whenever it was computing, but it used constants. It allowed you to store constants by using these dials, okay? Uh, Conrad Zusa, he was the first one to use bits, or one of the first ones, one of the first ones that I'm aware of, to use bits to compute things in his machine, in his Z1. And it used meta metallic strips in order to, the position of metallic strips in order to represent a one or a zero. Now, one of my favorite machines, one of my favorite early machines is the Manchester Small Scale Experimental Machine, otherwise known as the Baby. Now, the thing that was different between all those other machines that I talked about in the Manchester Baby is that all the earlier machines, they stored values using, for example, in the difference engine and the analytical engine that is created by Charles Babbage, they're designed by Charles Babbage, it stored programs on cards. These cards had holes punched in them that mimicked the same cards that were used by the Jacquard loom. The IBM machine, that one used paper tape. I think there were like 15 positions where holes could be positioned in these tapes. And then you had a reader that the tape went through to identify which pieces of code, which instructions were being executed. Conrad Zeus also used holes in tape. Now, the problem with this is that you can't do things like loops or conditional branches and things like that. But the Manchester baby it stored its code in memory. Now, its memory was, well, it was a cathode ray tube called a Williams Kilborn, I think Williams Kilburn tube. There were four of these tubes. One stored code, one, or excuse me, stored memory, data and code all together. One of them stored uh, an accumulator. One of them stored uh, a counter or a program counter. Uh, and the other one was used to display one of those three tubes to the user. Now, I could tell you things like, oh, the Manchester baby weighed a ton, or it was 14 feet wide by over six feet tall, or it used about 60 buttons and switches on the front of it as its IO or as its input so that you could input values into the machine. Or I could tell you that it had 550 vacuum tubes in order to perform its operation. A vacuum tube would kind of be like a switch, similar to what we would use a transistor for today. A transistor today, well, in modern CPUs, we have about 300 million, not just 550. Um, it used about 3.5 kilowatts of power, about 60 times that for a laptop. Now, I could tell you all those things, but that'd be no better than me telling you that I walked five miles to school whenever I was a kid, uphill both ways in the snow. No, what I want to do today is to show you how to program it. All right, now, let's talk a little bit about the top of the memory hierarchy. If you look back at episode 80, you'll see our discussion about the very top of the memory hierarchy, specifically the registers. Now, the Manchester baby had two registers. It had something, I think it was called the control instruction, CI. This is similar to our program counter some machines, remember, call the program counter the instruction pointer. It points to the next instruction to execute. We'll talk about some special things that we need to take into account whenever it comes to using CI. And then we also had an accumulator. Now the accumulator was where you were doing all of your computation. And so if you were adding two numbers together, you'd do it inside of that accumulator. And then there was one more thing, it was called the store. And the store was a 32-bit 
by 32 memory location memory. So both data and code were put into this store. Now, there are a couple of unique things. One of the most unique things is that, well, there were only seven instructions. Seven instructions total. Now, back in the 60s, if you were to buy a Lego, a box of Legos, yes, I've kind of shifted gears a lot, but let me get to, let me get to the analogy. Uh, if you were to buy a box of Legos, all the Legos were just bricks. This, you know, there may have been some different sizes, but they were all just, just this rectangular bricks with the, the buttons on the top of them that you could clip together. But yet you were still able to make significantly cool objects, toys, whatever, with these Legos. You didn't need to have all the fancy contours and shapes that you've got in a, Lego, in a box of Legos today. So look at the Manchester baby as being, you know, with these seven instructions, only seven instructions. No, we don't have a whole lot to work with, but we can still program anything that we want to using these seven instructions. Now, the instructions were stored in memory. And as I said, you've got 32-bit, 32 32-bits 32 stored in each memory location. Now, the first five bits, so we have 0, 1, 2, 3, and four. Those first five bits, this was the address that was being used for the instruction. So the majority of the instructions, not all of them, but a lot of the instructions, you know, four or so of them, had associated with it an address. Now we have five bits here. These five bits, of course, can go into 32 different patterns of ones and zeros. In other words, 32 different memory locations. So this could refer, refer, these five bits could refer to any position in our memory. But remember, this was the small scale experimental machine. So it was a stepping stone. So they actually had reserved almost all the way up, well, all the way up to position 12 so that you could have had up to 13 bits for the instruct for the excuse me for the address 2 to the 13th is equal to 8k so the original designers had actually designed this set this up so that it was possible to eventually expand this up to 8k of memory but for the experimental machine we only had 32 memory locations represented by those bits now another thing that was unique about how the the Manchester baby looked at binary was that it looked at it reading a bit. So, so if we're looking at binary, and I'm sure you're familiar with base two, and the idea that the rightmost position is the two to the zero position in base two, so that's the ones place, next bit up, going left is the twos place, and it's four, eight, 16, and so forth. Well, whenever you read bits, in the Manchester baby, you actually read left to right. In other words, this bit zero right here, that was actually your least significant bit. And so for example, let's say that I have the binary number 20, or excuse me, the decimal number 20. That in, in binary would be, well, there'd be no ones, right? There'd be no twos, there'd be a four, no eights and a 16, all right? So I've got my five bit number in binary representing 20. Well, how would that be stored here? Well, reading left to right, least significant. You know, it was as if you were reading in English, you know, any sort of uh, text that reads left to right, that was their way of interpreting these bits. So you'd put zero here and then zero, one, zero, one. And so that would be how you would represent address 20. All right. Now, if we move a little bit further up here, the next three bits, this was the command. All right. And so we have bits 13, 14, and 15. Now, if you have three bits, how many possible patterns of ones and zeros do you have? Two to the three or eight. That gives us room to have all seven instructions. Now, the instructions also were done 
least significant bit on the left side to most significant bit on the right side. And you may think, well, why would there, an instruction as isn't actually a number? Well, let me show you because this gives us an introduction into something called instruction set architecture. The way we use patterns of ones and zeros to represent the functions of the machine. Give me a second, let me make some room here so that I can start talking about the instructions that were available in the baby. We are going to number this. Now remember, what I've got is reading from left to right these three bits. So if you think about a truth table, the way we've been ordering the numbers in a truth table, we have the, le the most significant bit for three bits will have four zeros and then four ones, okay? Now, the next bit, the next most significant bit, would have two zeros, two ones, two zeros, two ones. But I'm gonna put that on the left side of this most significant bit. So we have two zeros, two ones, two zeros, two ones, and then the least significant bit goes zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one. And so what we've got here are the four, excuse me, the three bits that represent the different instructions that are being executed. So these first two instructions, these were, well, when you think of program control and so forth, and you think of loops and if statements and so forth, these are all implemented using something called a jump. Now, there were two types of jumps. So if you had a zero, zero as the most significant two bits of your instruction, what you were looking at was some sort of a jump instruction. Now, J, M, P. This is something we're going to call an indirect jump. All right. Now, an indirect jump. What an indirect jump means is that the address that is contained in that instruction is not the actual address that we're jumping to. Instead, the address that's being referred to, remember those most significant five bits, the address we're referring to is actually the address that contains the address that we want to jump to. This actually makes a little, this gives us a little bit of power. Um, because what happens is I can change what address I'm jumping to by changing a value in a memory location. All right. Instead of it being instead of the address, the destination that I'm jumping to, which one of these locations I'm jumping to being hard coded in the instruction. Instead, I've got a memory location that I can change around to change what I'm jumping to. So that's called an indirect jump. It actually takes two memory accesses. The first memory access is to access the instruction itself. And then the second memory access is to access the address that's contained in that instruction in order to then figure out where we're jumping to. So it takes those two memory address, those two memory accesses. Now, the next one is a JRP, which is a relative jump. Now this is an incredibly, it, 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 was, it was ahead of its time because not only are we storing code in with memory, but this instruction right here allows us to have what we call relocatable code because the way this instruction worked was it had an address associated with it, but that address did not contain the address we were jumping to. Instead, that address contained a number we were going to add to our program counter, to our control, that was going to allow us to jump forward or backwards. So for example, let's say that I had negative three contained in the address that's being referred to by JRP. Negative three is added to my control. That makes it so that the control points back three instructions above, you know, less than what I'm, uh, what I'm currently executing. Now what this does, the power of this instruction is it gives us something called relocatable code. And so all I have to do is use these relative jumps and I can store my code wherever I want to because instead of jumping to an absolute address as identified by an indirect jump, I'm actually going back or forwards relative to where I'm currently located or the instruction I'm currently executing. So that relative jump is actually pretty important.
All right. Now, these next two instructions are my memory instructions. Now, what do my memory instructions do? Well, I'm loading and I'm storing. Now, here's where some weirdness starts happening with the Manchester baby. The first one is LDN, and this is a negative load. Now, just like the first two instructions, LDN also has a memory address associated with it. And that address is the value that I'm going to load from memory into my accumulator. But as I'm loading it in, I negate it using two's complement. Check back in one of the earlier episodes if, you're, if you don't remember exactly what two's complement is, but two's complement was a way to use binary numbers to represent negative values. And so whenever I do a load, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make it negative before loading it into the accumulator. Okay, makes things a little complicated. We'll see when we start writing our first program. The second one is just the store command. So just store, don't do any negative, uh, just store to memory. So it takes the accumulator, it takes that accumulator, and it just stores it to the address that is associated with that command. Now, the next two, the ones that are identified by the most significant being, bit being a one, the next most significant bit being a zero, so a one zero. This is, well, these are the math operations. I'm just going to put math. Now, there wasn't a whole lot. In fact, you'll notice that it says seven instructions up here. That's basically because both of these patterns of ones and zeros represented the same instruction. And that was subtract. And so subtract memory from, from the accumulator. So whatever memory address that I'm pointing to, I simply subtract the value that's contained at that memory address. I subtract it from the accumulator. And if you, were, if you had either one of these patterns of ones and zeros in the instruction, then uh, it still did the same thing. It just did a subtract from memory. All right, so those first five guys all have an address associated with it, an address associated with it in terms of what we were going to grab or use from memory in order to do our execution. These last two guys, these are more what I'm going to refer to as program control. All right, program control. Now, there were two of them. The first one is compare. Now, in one of the earlier episodes, we talked about the compare instruction. And so if I had like compare A with B, you did this subtract from of A minus B. You perform this virtual subtract. You set your flags and those and the base in and, and those flags, however those flags were set, that told you uh, whether it was greater than, equal to, less than, greater than or equal to, and so forth. And so you could actually do conditional branches after that, depending on uh, the setting of those flags. This is not that advanced. No. What this simply says is skip next instruction if accumulator is negative. All right, last one's pretty much the easiest one. Stop. It just halts execution. All right, that's really it. Now, there are a couple of other things that you need to know about this machine before you can start programming it, but I'm gonna make some room first. So before we start programming with this, there are a couple of things that you need to know. First of all, the control, CI, and remember, it's acting as the program counter. The first thing that we need to know about the control is that it is incremented before executing an instruction. right before. And so the way this works is that whenever you reset the baby, 
and let's say that you're, you know, when you reset it, can the control goes to address zero. So it's at that top line, it's at that first memory location, right? What is the first instruction to get executed? Well, it turns out it's instruction one. Because right before you start executing your code, it is going to do an increment of the control. And that puts you down to instruction one. Now, this is also important to recognize so that, um, so you need to observe this when jumping. So, we had those two jump instructions, JMP and JRP. Now, JMP and JRP both grabbed something from memory and used it to modify the control. But right before the next instruction is executed, the control is incremented. So, anytime you're doing a jump, make sure that you're jumping to the instruction before the one you wanna execute next, because you wanna make sure that you're executing according to it being incremented, the control being incremented, right before you, uh, right before you execute um, your instruction. Another thing is that um, the arithmetic unit which all integers, 32-bit integers, does everything in two's complement, but remember, it only uses negative load and subtraction, right? So oftentimes, you have to use, and, and this is not great whenever you've only got through to 32 memory locations, but oftentimes if you want to keep your numbers positive, what you need to do is store, you'll be doing everything in negative in your arithmetic unit for subtract. So if I wanted to add two numbers, I load the negative, I subtract it. Now I've got the negative of the sum. What I want to do then is store it, load it, loading it negates it, turns it positive, and store it again. So oftentimes, after you've finished doing your computations in negative, then what you need to do is ju just do a store, a load, and a store in order to make sure that the final result is positive. And then the last thing is to remember that uh, the bits are stored the least significant bit first. In other words, the leftmost bit is the least significant bit. So, keeping it, and, and that's true for my instructions, that's in tr true for my addresses, that's true for the values, everything is stored least significant bit on the leftmost side. All right, now, now that we've got a little bit of an idea of exactly how our code is being executed on this machine, let's go ahead and write some programs. Now, the first bit of code we are going to write for the Manchester Baby is sort of a hello world version for the Manchester Baby. But the Manchester Baby didn't have any real output other than that CRT displaying the contents of memory. So our hello world is just going to be a simple piece of code. We're just going to add two numbers together. Now, before we do that, let's go ahead and as a reference, go ahead and write all the instructions that are available to us up here in this corner of the board. All the instructions, all seven of them. Now, remember, because all we can do is load negative and perform a subtraction, in order to do this thing where we're just gonna simply add two numbers together, well, we're gonna have to do it with negatives. We're gonna have to do all of those values in negative in the accumulator before converting it to a positive number to be stored in memory. Now, location 29, we're gonna store one of our integer values. Location 30, we're gonna store the other integer value. And in location 31, the very bottom of our memory space, we're gonna store the result. So, the very first thing that we need to do is we need to get one of the values, right? We're gonna bring it into the accumulator. And so we're gonna perform an LDN, a load negative of the value that's at address, address 29, all right? Now, once we load the negative value, then all we should need to do is subtract the next value. And by subtracting the next value, all that we're gonna do is put the sum, the negative of the sum, in our accumulator. Now it's time to store it. Now remember, 
all we can do is if we do a store 31, that's going to take the negative of our sum, put it in location 31. So we need to make it positive. Making it positive is really simple, but it does take two instructions. First thing we're going to do is we're going to reload what we stored at 31, and that's going to convert it to a positive value, the positive sum, which we can now store back in 31. So those five instructions are enough to simply add two values together, and then the, res the result being negative, and then convert it to a positive value to be stored in location 31. Now, we're used to, if you code, you're used to probably at the end of your code having control returned back to the operating system or back to some sort of a master software that's being executed. Problem is, is that we don't have any sort of operating system running on the Manchester baby. And if we don't do something to stop execution of code, it's just going to simply execute invalid code and just, and just keep going forever and possibly, you know, stomp all over things that we want to keep. So we need to perform this stop instruction. Now there's no address associated with the stop instruction, but the other instructions do have addresses associated with them. Now, there are a couple of important things that we've already talked about. The first thing is, is that remember that before executing an instruction, the control, the control, um, the, the control instruction, the CI register, the one that's pointing to the next instruction to execute, it gets incremented before executing the instruction. So this first instruction right here is actually going to be at address one. So the pointer, the control gets initialized to address zero. And so we're actually going to have our first instruction be address at address one. And so the rest of these addresses, we just put them in sequentially because as you probably recognize from the operation of the control, every time you execute an instruction, you increment, increment to the next instruction. All right. So those are our, that's our program. Pretty simple, huh? Now, what does it look like in the memory of the Manchester baby? Well, now remember that the first five bits are the address, right? And so that's the address that's acting as this operand here. And so the 29, 29 in binary is 11101, which means that because we start with the least significant bit, it's going to be 10111. All right, that will give us the address. And remember, those are the leftmost bits for this memory location. Now, after this, remember that they left some bits for potential expansion up to 8K of memory. So there are going to be eight zeros from the end of the five bit address until we get to the command. Now the command in this case for LDN, LDN is 010, 010. And then we're gonna, so there's the command right there. And we're going to separate our address from this filler of zeros. And then we had zeros all the way to the end of the instruction. So if you look at this, the way it's going to show up in memory is that, okay, now the first row, which is line zero, doesn't have anything in it right now, just a number zero. But the next line, the line that corresponds to instruction one, that one is going to contain the, this command right here. So if you look at the very second line, the second line, the first line's empty, second line is going to get that pattern of ones and zeros in it. That's the instruction. Now let's convert the rest of these instructions to what is really called machine code, the code that the machine is going to understand. So 30. In binary, 30 is 11110. So in our backwards way of representing addresses, we get 01111. Then we have this filler space, and then we get the command. The command for sub is 001, and then we have filler. So that is going to go in line 2, 012. All right. Then we've got store 31. 31 in binary is five ones in a row. So that's pretty easy to reverse order here. We're gonna get five ones. And then the store command. So the store command is 110. So we have 110 and you're gonna put that into address location three. LDN 31, same address. 
Whenever we put the LDN command, that's going to be 0, 1, 0. All right. And then we store 31. And then the store is 1, 1, 0. And so what we've got is our load command and then our store command, which is going to make that positive. Last of all, we have the stop command. Now the command for that is 111, but we don't have an address associated with it. Now you could put patterns of ones and zeros in there. It shouldn't have any effect on the operation of the Manchester baby, but we're just going to leave it zeros. All right. Now this brings us all the way to the bottom where we need to define these two variables. So all the way down at address 29, we're going to have a num. I don't know. How about we put in, I don't know, 28. All right. Now the entire third, whenever we're defining a number, the entire 32 bits is dedicated to the twos complement representation of that number. Now, 28 in binary, well, that's 16 plus, let's see, 16 plus 8 plus 4, is it? And so in uh, 28 in binary is going to be 11100. Zero, zero. And so we put this in reverse order, you get 00111, one, 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 and then all zeros, right? And so that goes in address 29. In address 30, what we're going to do is put a num, how about uh, 14? And that'll be 011100 and so forth. So we've got, um, we've got uh, 8 plus 4 is 12, plus 2 is 14. And then in 31, we're just going to leave that guy blank until we run it. Now, on the Manchester Baby, there's a switch, and you switch it to on, you drop that switch down, it runs. And whenever it finishes, there's a small light in the upper, well, if you're looking at the panel from the front, it's going to be in the upper left-hand corner. That light turns on whenever we hit this stop instruction to show that the, that the program has, been, has completed. So we run the program, and we get, well... Pattern of ones and zeros is 01010101000 in that last line, right? What does that equal? Well, if we look at the powers of two, starting with the least significant bit, this is the ones place, two, four, eight, 16, 32. It's as far as we need to go. So we have 32 plus eight, that's 40, plus two, that's 42. So this is equal to a decimal. 42. What's 28 plus 14? 42. All right. Now, we started out really slow, but we're going we're gonna to take our game up a notch in the next lesson, because in the next lesson, we're going to start doing some more complicated things. In fact, we're going to take advantage of these two instructions here to show how to perform loops and make our code more robust. We may even take a look at some of the original code that was done. Now, any of, these, any of these Manchester baby assignments we could do using simulators, and there are a bunch of simulators there out on the web. In fact, we'll talk about those also in the next lesson.